Let's turn to Anders in uh, Stockholm, in Sweden, who emails in to say, um, Jesus' second coming is something we're all waiting for. But according to William Lane Craig, N.T. Wright's view is quite different. And I would like some clarification now to set the scene. William Lane Craig is a well-known Christian philosopher mm -hmm. from the USA. I know that he's been working on his own uh, research in atonement and so on, and obviously looking into your views. Anyway, um, this is the, the piece that's quoted by Anders from William Lane Craig, um, saying, N.T. Wright has this very peculiar view that the Son of Man returned in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. Anders is looking for clarification on that quote. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, I mean, I've known Bill Craig for quite some time, and we've argued in public, and sometimes we've agreed in public, as well as disagreed, and that's fine. Um, and yes, he is working on atonement, and yes, he disagrees with my view on that, and that's fine too. This is how we learn from one another, hopefully. But he's wrong in terms of saying that I say that in, this is Mark 13 and Matthew 24 and, and, and uh, Luke 19, and uh, sorry, Luke 21 and so on, that the Son of Man is returning at AD 70. The problem comes with the idea of the coming of the Son of Man. When you read Daniel 7, which is one of the most important biblical texts for the early Christians and for Jesus himself, you have to realize what's going on. And sadly, um, I may not have made this clear in Jesus and the Victory of God, but I had a whole long chapter on this. I thought I had made it clear mm. that the way that Daniel 7 is being read in the first century is not about somebody called the Son of Man coming downwards from heaven to earth, but about this figure one like a son of man coming on the clouds to be seated beside the ancient of days who is God. So here's the scenario. And actually, there's a kind of a kid's version of it in the previous chapter, because in Daniel chapter six, we have Daniel himself in the lion's den. So what is this about? Daniel is a human being. He's put down into this den, surrounded by man-eating monsters. And in the morning, the king comes and looks down into the lion's den. Lo and behold, Daniel is still alive and well, and the lions are still hungry. Um, <laughs> and the king brings up Daniel out of the den and makes him the second ruler in the kingdom. Mm. That is exactly the same picture that you then have in Daniel 7, where you have this image of the great sea monsters, the monsters coming up out of the deep, which, as anyone who knows the Jewish literature of the time knows, these are not... Uh, literal prophecies about sort of Day of the Triffids monsters mm. coming up out of the Mediterranean, you know. These are great world empires. They are, they are nations and kingdoms and can be variously interpreted, Babylon, Syria, Greece, Rome, whatever. But then when the fourth and last one has done its worst, then one like a son of man is brought up to sit beside the Ancient of Days. And there's no question as to what that means in the text itself, because it's interpreted twice. There's a short interpretation, then it's an expanded interpretation. And it's about, quote, the people of the saints of the Most High, i.e. the faithful Israelites, will receive the kingdom and will reign forever and ever. In other words, God will vindicate his people and they will be the judges of the world mm. and the monsters will get their comeuppance. And when Paul says in 1 Corinthians that don't you know that we will judge angels and we want to say, uh, no, actually, Paul, we didn't know that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tell us more. I think this is the sort of passage he's referring to, yes. that actually this is in Jewish, Second Temple Jewish thought, this is how the scenario is going to play out. So now, cut to Mark 13 when Jesus and his disciples are uh, uh, there by the temple and the disciples are saying, wow, this is an amazing building. And Jesus says, actually, guess what? It's all going to come tumbling down. Mm. And they say, uh, when, how, what's that about? What, what, what's this all going to be? Because the great scenario at the end of Matthew, Mark, and Luke is a kind of confrontation between Jesus and the temple, and particularly a confrontation between Jesus and the high priest who represents the current temple regime. Because in the Gospels, Jesus himself is presented as the true temple. So the place isn't big enough for them both, to put it crudely. Hmm. And so this is all about the temple is going to be destroyed, which will constitute Jesus' visible vindication. Jesus will be raised from the dead, Jesus will then be exalted, and the sign that he is exalted is that the temple which has opposed him will be destroyed. In order to get that, you need to see how it's then applied in the next chapter when Jesus stands before Caiaphas, the high priest, 
And Caiaphas says, what's this nonsense about destroying and rebuilding the temple? Jesus doesn't answer because there's no way he can explain Mm. that to Caiaphas. But then Caiaphas goes for the jugular. Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And Jesus it, it, there's there's no easy English translation for you've said it or, or is it yes or is it the words are yours or whatever. But then comes the crucial thing. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That does not mean that Caiaphas will look out of the window and see Jesus coming downwards on a cloud. That is a crass, modern, literalistic misinterpretation. In Matthew and in Luke, many people think they are just making Mark a bit more clear here, It says, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then at the end of Matthew's gospel, we're referring back to Daniel 7, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Mm. In other words, Matthew and Luke interpreting Mark, and I think it's so so in Mark, but with Mark, it's very dense and, and, Mm. and, and can be misinterpreted are quite clear that the Son of Man passage in Daniel 7 refers to Jesus' vindication that the destruction of the temple is a generation later is the ultimate sign that God has vindicated and is vindicating Jesus. And that and people have said, oh, this means N.T. Wright doesn't believe in the second coming. No, watch my <laughs> lips. Of course the second coming is real. Mm. That's there all over the New mm. Testament. But these texts are not about the second coming. Right. They are about the vindication of Jesus. Now, I'm sorry, that's a long answer, but it's but, really but, important. But just to, um, just to recapitulate on that, the, the AD 70, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and so on, what, what is the, the significance of that in terms of, you know, what, what Jesus said and what... The significance of it is that uh, God in Jesus is starting a true temple movement. Mm. When you look back from the gospel stories of Jesus, you see that actually the temple in Jerusalem was always intended as an advance signpost Mm. of a coming reality. But if you mistake the signpost for the reality, it becomes an idol. You see this in the speech of Stephen in Acts very clearly. And actually, all the way through Acts, all the clashes are about temples, whether it's in Athens or Ephesus or Jerusalem. Uh, and, And the question is, where are heaven and earth coming together now? Mm. And the church is constituted on the belief, which is dangerous and scary, that this is where heaven and earth are coming together. For podcast episodes, bonus content, and to ask your question, sign up at askntwrite.com.